to the Poverty Narrative series dedicated to promoting a deeper understanding of poverty in the U.S., especially in the Midwest. I'm Lynette Clementson, director of Wallace House, the Knight Wallace Fellowships for Journalists and the Livingston Awards here at the University of Michigan. I'm gonna be moderating our conversation today. The goal of this series is to promote in-depth, impactful, solutions-oriented coverage of poverty issues in the United States. Each session, uh, if you haven't been following until today, these, this series runs every Tuesday and Thursday at noon throughout the month of June. If you missed the first part of the series, you can go back and look at previous discussions on the Poverty Solutions website, which is poverty.umich.edu. The series is supported by the, Mid with the Midwest Mobility from Poverty Network and with generous support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I know we're eager to jump into our conversation today, but I just wanna cover some logistics before we get started. We definitely want to hear from you, your questions, thoughts, the things you're struggling with, uh, related to covering poverty in the United States. You should see a chat box to the right of your screen. Someone will be moderating uh, your questions there, making sure they get to me so I can get them to our panelists. And you can also uh, ask us questions on Twitter and YouTube using the hashtag poverty narrative. We wanna have a respectful, engaging conversation and we encourage a wide range of debate and conversation, we will be um, attentive to inappropriate content. So ask that you uh, keep the conversation respectful. So what are we here to talk about today? What are the differences between our assumptions about poverty and people's actual lived experience? Disadvantage takes different forms in different places, different regions, different parts of the country. And context is important when we're talking about poverty. I'm joined by a great panel today, and I'd like to introduce them to you. This series was put together uh, by Luke Schaefer, who's usually moderating these conversations, and my, I, my hope is that by my being here, he can talk a little bit more. Luke is faculty director of Poverty Solutions, professor of uh, social justice at the University of Michigan. He'll share more about his work understanding deep disadvantage in the United States and the factors that drive disparity and disadvantage in our country. David Jesse is a reporter at the Detroit Free Press. He's covered higher education for more than a decade. And for the purposes of our conversation today, he's here to talk mostly about work he did last year in Northern Michigan, looking at rural communities and places that he calls education deserts and how that contributes to the poverty narrative in the United States. Glennon Sweeney is Senior Research Associate at the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at Ohio State University. Her engaged scholarship focuses on metropolitan neighborhood change, food justice, and community university collaboration. And Roshanek Maripana is Assistant Professor in the Department of Health and Behavior Education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She's led several projects on housing and health, affordability and discrimination in the US, and she's here to give us a public health perspective on things. So before we jump into individual conversations, I think we should start with Luke. And Luke, I want you to help everybody get on the, page, on the same page for how we start this conversation. Of course, we're glad so many journalists have joined us here today. Journalists' primary aim is to reflect society and communities and people's experiences with all the nuance that the human experience dictates, but it is hard to do. Journalists work on deadline, we face breaking news situations, and uh, every journalist works with time and space constraints that can make it hard to bring as much depth and nuance to any story we cover. Also, sometimes editors uh, in working with copy will reduce things to make things fit to space or, or sometimes what they think makes something more efficient, actually introduce errors or cliches mm -hmm. into stories, which is a big problem when we're um, dealing with issues of poverty in the United States. So 
can you start by getting us onto a shared framework? How do we even understand poverty and place in the United States? So I would say in my own career uh, as a public facing scholar, and it's great to uh, be with everyone again, just let me say, and I'm broadcasting from a different room of my house. You may see my entire house over the course of our uh, time together. Um, I think one of the themes that's really come out in the first two sessions was the extent to which uh, poverty, re uh, poverty journalism, journalism about issues related to poverty, and maybe poverty is too small a frame and we should think more broadly, uh, should be investigative journalism, should be about trying to figure out what is in the stories that does go against people's assumptions, Right when we have these narratives, I think often that's the the, the biggest challenge. Right, as, as we're talking about folks who are under deadline or trying to move things along, it's easy to fall back on those narratives that we uh, have. We don't come as a blank slate as we do to so much of the types of things that we study and types of things that we write about. And for me, uh, research on poverty uh, in the last seven to 10 years of my career is really about realizing often how little I know at the onset, right? And how often I'm, I'm wrong about things. So uh, my, my book a few years ago, $2 a day, living on almost nothing in America, gave me a chance to um, get to know families who were experiencing very low levels of cash income in Chicago and Cleveland, down in Appalachia and the Mississippi Delta and uh, just really get to know about their lives and their experiences. And I was struck by how from my positionality as a professor, as a white professor, as a white professor at a, at a top tier institution, uh, sometimes I didn't even know the right questions to ask, right? Uh, I would often sort of assume I knew what was going on and a lot of what I was doing was based on the literature, but when you really get out and talk to people, you learn about a whole, you know, whole sets of things. Our work in Detroit around auto insurance and tax foreclosure, right? These are things that really impact um, vulnerable families that we wouldn't know to ask until we went out. And uh, I learned all about the world of plasma donation as a as a primary coping strategy. And then did crossover work in the Atlantic on plasma companies and the profitability of that and just raising questions about how much should we expect somebody who sells their plasma to, um, to really uh, get paid and, and should we have plasma paid plasma donation at all. So uh, I was doing a lot of that work and sort of going along and trying to really understand um, the deepness of uh, people's experiences and how much I miss when I'm not actually directly connected to it. And uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation approached uh, me and, and my collaborator, Kathy Eden, and said, could you do something that replicates your work at um, in $2 a day at the community level? So could you look not just at people, right? Could you look not just at families, but at the communities that they're situated in? Uh, very, very poor communities or very disadvantaged communities and tell us a story about what's going on there. Are there community level factors that uh, lead to these conditions or are associated with them? So Kathy and I decided we didn't just want to use poverty data, sort of going back to this theme we've been talking about, about the poverty frame being too small. We wanted to use poverty data and health data and some great data on social mobility. If you grew up poor, what were your chances of, of being low income as, as an adult? So we put in all of these factors into a principal component analysis that tries to look at variation. We looked at all counties in the United States. We looked at large cities, 500 largest cities. That takes you down to populations of about 40,000. And uh, we, tried to sort of look at this variation across income, across health, across social mobility, and rank them on an index of disadvantage. Thinking about all of these factors and saying, where are some of our most vulnerable communities? Where are the ones that both have very high poverty rates, poor health, 
and major challenges with social mobility. And we were struck on this issue of place that you mentioned at the start. Uh, we were struck about uh, the extent to which so much of poverty research is undertaken in urban areas, in cities. Yet so much of what we saw in this, in this analysis of disadvantage across all of these factors was rural, right? That a lot of the places that we saw that were popping up um, as most disadvantaged were rural. And we were also struck with the clusters. So in this map, you can see sort of the, the darkest blue is the places with the most disadvantage. And as it gets lighter and lighter, you see disadvantage declining. We can see down the Mississippi Delta, across the south, Appalachia, uh, along the Texas-Mexico border, and then out west as we get into a lot of um, tribal lands. So we were struck by this. So I can imagine so much of scholarship on poverty in the United States for, you know, at one, every one book on rural poverty in the United States, we probably have 50 or 100 books that are targeting large cities, places like Chicago, places like New York. Mm -hmm. But when we use this index, uh, we find that of the 100 most communities of deepest disadvantage, only nine are large cities. And in fact, 19 are rural counties in Mississippi. 21 are rural areas that include tribal lands. So you start to see that maybe the sort of poverty and understanding disadvantage isn't only an urban issue. Maybe actually uh, it might even be more concentrated. And at least I think we can say we've been missing a lot of the action. But the uh, word, even the word urban, Lou, yeah. is, is one that I, I would love you to push us as journalists to reconsider how we use that word. Um, often it's code. As an editor, I often will strike through or make somebody explain when they write urban or inner city, what are you actually trying to say? Because a lot of times we use both in speech and in writing, urban and inner city are shorthand for what people consider to be black and poor. And, and not in using those words loosely erases not only the experience of people who are living in cities, but it also er erases all of the experiences of the people who are showing up on your, uh, in your study. That's, that's exactly right, because one of the things we found is both the communities uh, that are, have you know, disadvantage across all of these factors, though they're both rural, and that shorthand doesn't work in this case, because rural in this case does not equal white. In fact, there is a diversity across this group. Lots of people of color uh, and uh, also white communities, especially in Appalachia. But these dichotomies really start to break down when you look at it closely. And finally, one more piece that I would put in there is what came really clear in this to me was the importance of history. So I've thought about history. And in our first couple of sessions, we talked about the importance of of following policy choices, long-term exploitation, long-term sort of structural racism. Mm -hmm. But much of poverty research, and I would say a lot of my own poverty research, really sort of recognizes that, but really focuses on the present day. And I was really struck when we compared our map of deep disadvantage to a map of enslavement from the 1860s to find not just the general patterns, but the overall sort of shading of these two maps looks strikingly similar. It's incredible. So a couple of the takeaways for me is that we really need to branch out. We need to look at the ways in which uh, the challenges that are faced by folks in cities, challenges that are faced by folks in the suburbs and rural areas, when are they the same? When are they different? And again, just like you said, when are presumptions of those things uh, just completely off the mark? So in this case, if I thought rural poverty was about rural whites, uh, I would be missing a lot of the picture. And if we use the shorthand, as you said, Lynette, 
the same would be true. So that that uh, provides a good segue to move to David and 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 to talk a little bit about what he found reporting in rural Michigan. You spent uh, David last a lot of 2019, basically the whole summer in. Uh, Everybody knows Michigan is is a thumb <laughs> in the in the upper part of of Michigan, uh, specifically on in in the northwestern part of Michigan in Baldwin, and looking at places that where you concluded that the disadvantage in those places was tied to an access to higher education. Uh, and you used a really interesting term that I don't hear used a lot. We're all now used to the term food desert, but you talked about higher education deserts. Um, and, and I was struck by the, the cycle that you outlined in your reporting that um, in these counties and small towns where people couldn't easily drive to a community college or a four-year college uh, that people got stuck at the level of a high school education. And by being stuck at that level, they didn't have skills for a modern workforce. And when you don't have skills for a modern workforce, there's no incentive for small companies, small manufacturers to want to move to those towns because the skilled workforce is lacking. And because there are not well-paid, skilled jobs, people are stuck in poverty. And being stuck in poverty means you have less access to higher education, less connection even to the networks that would direct you to higher education. And the cycle just repeats, repeats, repeats. So um, I found myself really challenged by, especially some of the way we talk about rural communities in our current political context. And a lot of the nuance in your reporting really challenged me. Um, and so talk to us about what you found as a reporter and how, how you were challenged and how you, what tips you might have for other reporters in covering rural communities. Well, thanks for letting me, me come on and talk. I'm, I'm interested in this topic and always glad to, glad to spend some time uh, thinking about it and learning from, from others. You know, so much of what Luke was just talking about is what we found, what I found as I was doing my reporting. Um, we spent a lot of time um, thinking about poverty. I've been interested in this topic for, for most of my, my career, which is pressing a couple decades uh, now. And I'm interested in it as uh, the, they talked about on an earlier panel about it being an investigative story, about looking in places where you wouldn't necessarily think think about poverty. So for example, a decade ago, I did a series of stories looking at poverty in Ann Arbor and how it was hidden in, in there. And a couple of years ago, I was driving through, through Northern Michigan and I was looking at, at some of these small towns that I was driving through and looking at some of the, the places there. And I was wondering, what is it like to be poor, to be growing up in poverty, to not have um, in these areas, and why is it? What is it about about this? The other thing that went on is for my bulk of my job, I'm the higher ed reporter. I cover higher education across the state of Michigan, and so almost all of the higher education institutions that I cover are in the in the bottom uh, third of this third of the state, and so you start thinking about access and how do you get to get to places. Um, how do you get to that training? Lynette, you just mentioned that kind of vicious cycle that, that goes on. And we can see the correlation pretty pretty easily in really basic details. If you just look at the richest counties, the poorest counties by, by average uh, household income in the state, so towards the top end of the list is Washtenaw County, and that just makes sense, right? We have the University of Michigan here, we have Eastern Michigan, we have a lot of stuff that's around that. And then you look at the you look at the some of the poorest places. The poorest uh, county in the state is actually Lake County, which again, you know, in the, in the map is over 
over in the middle of the middle of the state towards the western edge. Um, and it has the poorest median household income of, of any county, even Wayne County, where the city of Detroit is, has a higher median median um, household income. So if you start looking at that, and you start thinking about, well, I wonder what else we can learn about Lake County. Well, it turns out that Lake County has the second lowest percentage of adults with college degrees. Hmm. So there's that correlation, right? And as you talked about, Lynette, there's not that... Uh, there, there's not that opportunity for training. So I went to Baldwin and I, I went in and I met with the, the president of the local bank, right? If you're going to think about the economy, right? Who's the and economic issues? Who's the, you know, she's the person who, who knows how many people are, you know, we're, are defaulting on, on mortgages. How many are struggling? What's the banking activity? What are the businesses? You know, and I, I asked her this question that, I, that pretty much stumped her. She sat there very quietly for an extended amount of time. I said, so if I if I had a college degree and I lived here in Baldwin, a beautiful place to, to go visit right on, there's rivers and national forest there. If I, if I lived here and had a college degree, what could I do for a job? She thought and thought and thought. And she said, well, you could be, be in the, you could be a banker. You could be, um, you know, you could work for the one doctor you could work for, and there were like two or three other options. So there just weren't, there aren't options there. It's that, it's that cycle. So what does it mean to, to, to live in this area? One, if you're coming out of high school and you're looking um, for places to go, you're going to have to travel. Um, the nearest community college, right? Community colleges are designed for kind of those, those trade skills, those um, one-year certificates, the two-year degrees, uh, welding, nursing, all the stuff that kind of makes stuff run. The nearest place is a half an hour drive in the summer. And <laughs> for those of you who are in Michigan, you'll understand why that that's an issue out in winter roads, right? And so let's talk about poverty. If I'm, if I'm living in that area, I got to drive at least a half an hour to get to college, to get some sort of advanced training. Now I have to have a car, right? There's no, there's no transportation. There's no jumping on a bus um, and, and riding. Where I live here in Washington County, there's a lot of poverty around, but we can, I can ride a bus. It takes a while, but I can eventually get to a community college. I can get to Eastern Michigan. I, I can get to, get to U of M. I live out there, I don't. So I'm gonna have to have a car. That's going to cost money. Not only do I have to have a car, I have to have a car that can survive an hour round trip every 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 day. Um, so that's one of the one of the differences. A lot of it is is this is the same when you talk rural and city uh, poverty, right? Um, I was having a conversation as I was working on this uh, actually with Luke, and uh, you know, Luke mentioned that a lot of the a lot of the details are the same or a lot of the issues are the same, the details just change. So mm -hmm. in the city of Detroit, right, there's worries about uh, DTE shutting off your electricity and your heat. There's issues about water. The you know There's a lot in the news about water shutoffs in the city of D Detroit. Well, that's the same out in some of the rural areas, but instead of DTE, now I'm worried about the propane. Can, mm -hmm. I, can I afford to have fill the propane? Um, it, what's with my well and septic system? There are other issues that you don't necessarily think about when you think about poverty. Think about the the access to social services, to to food banks, to counseling, to all the stuff that goes around. It's just not there out in these areas because everything's everything's spread out. the The whole system is kind of geared against some of the some of the folks who live in this. Think about. Um, you know, so we know folks that have applied for uh, for for um, food stamps, for um, for assist food assistance, or stuff like that, and they'll come in and they'll say, "Well, you live on this giant chunk of chunk of land um, that counts towards." Well, yeah, I got this giant chunk of land, but nobody, I can't sell it. No one's going to buy it. I don't have anything. Or they're going to say, "Hey, you have a boat." Well, what they don't know is that boat is used to fishing so I can feed my family. You know, it's not, it's not a luxury thing that we go out uh, cruising on, uh, you know, in the sun, in the, for a sunset cruise. And so there's some differences, differences there. And even, even I guess access to services. I, I was struck 
by the, the you talked about the high school in this in this small town in Baldwin, and um, and that even if students wanted to take the kind of courses that would prepare them uh, to be competitive in a college application, even that was limited. And and you talked about a, a commuter bus that took students from the high school 40 minutes or an hour away to this makeshift place that where they were offering sort of college readiness kind of courses. And one of the women in your story was the was the first person from her school to be admitted to the University of Michigan in a decade. Uh, yeah. which I found incredibly surprising. And, and there was and there was and she could point like there she was could point to the person who had been that person a decade before. And when you talk to that person, which we did, she could point to a person a decade before her. Right. It, it was it was. It was a, such a rare, a rare thing, but there was, right, there's no access to that. And part of that is because Michigan is such a unique situation in that it's community colleges and it's uh, four-year colleges. There's no overarching um, higher ed commission or system, right? We're all, they're all individuals. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that if I'm running Jesse University, I got to come up with students. So where am I going to locate? Well, I'm going to locate in a place where I can get where I can get students. Um, there's a interesting, and we're just we're just structured that way. So again, that's that's the, the structure. So that's why you see these 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 um, big jumps in in access. And and they're just we're going to save most questions to the end, but. But this is one that's on my mind anyway, because somebody just asked, uh, "Well, what about what about online learning? If you can, if you don't have a car and you can't drive, can't you just take online classes?" But that means you have to have um, reliable internet access, right? Yeah, exactly, right. And this was one of the things you know we talk about as journalists going in with preconceived ideas, because that was my preconceived idea, like both for education. Well, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just take everything online. Or even for work, right? I mean, we've all been working remotely for the last three <laughs> for the last three months. Why can't I have just done that? I, I think a lot of my brother, who uh, works for a computer software company, he can live anywhere in the na anywhere in the country, right? They love the outdoors. He does all his stuff online. Why not? Why can't he live in one of these little town little towns? Well, it's that it's that infrastructure. It's not there. There's not reliable online learning. Um, there's also things you can't do online, right? So uh, I graduated with a degree in English, useful for what I do now, but not much else. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so I could do all mine, right? I could read, I could go online, I could have discussions with a professor, with a class, much like we're doing today. But think about welding. How do you teach welding online? How do you teach uh, teach nursing online? There's lectures that can explain, but at some point you have to be able to have your hands on. So you have to be in that lab. You have to you have to make that weld and have the professor come over and be like, mm, "Nope, that doesn't work. Here's what you should have done." And so that's the drawback. And so you get into these areas, and there's a there's a huge lack of of infrastructure. And so as we talk about going forward, what are some of the needs of some of these places? Well, it's not just it's not just jobs. In order to get the jobs, in order to get the training, you have to have this infrastructure, much like you have to have roads, right? Or you had to have train tracks. Now you have to have now you have to have um, you have to have this broadband, this reliable and affordable, right? It also does no good if we have broadband in there, but it's 150 bucks a month. Right? How are you, you're already struggling to eat. You're not gonna. You're not gonna spend 150 bucks on on broadband. And so, what you're talking about now has to do with 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 notions of isolation and access, uh, and how those play out both physically and and um, with regard to things like internet access that that can be as isolating as a lack of roads. And that's a good place to to bring Glennon in. And her work in in metropolitan uh, Columbus, Ohio, and and around food access, which is also a part of this. 
And Glennon, um, you did an interesting study in, in your work looking at, people have heard of the term food deserts. Um, but in your work with communities on Chicago, on Columbus's south side, uh, Columbus is seen is seen as a, it's not a, a big city. It's the capital of Ohio, it's, but but it's it's the third. It's, I think it's the second largest city in the Midwest. Yeah. But it's but in what people think of it as a city, you know, it's it's. It has a lot of suburban kind of spaces and neighborhoods, and it and it's so it's a large metropolitan space. Um, and so you did a tell us about the work you did where you where you put a group together and gave people twenty dollars and asked them to document where and how they would access food. Yeah, so we did this on Columbus and South Side um, in partnership with uh, my brother's, I am my brother's keeper, which is now called my brother's keeper in Columbus as part of the Obama initiative, my brother's keeper initiative. And we also did it in Butler County, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cincinnati. Uh, Westchester was the name of the community. Um, and so this work, what we did is we actually used a participatory mapping approach known as Heal Maps, created by Deborah Johns out at Oregon State University, the other OSU. Um, and we adapted it. Um, we added the $20 exercise in, but really the goal of this approach was to get people to go out into their community, purchase food, and record, you know, track in terms of having a GIS device that will track the route and take pictures of barriers to the facilitators of food access so that we could get a better understanding. Because like Luke said, we don't always know the right questions to ask, ask right? So we wanted community members to tell us how they experience their food environment. Um, and so, you know, after people go out and do this, we bring them together, we have them collectively, um, we're just hearing a little bit of feedback from your mic. I'm seeing the, I, I'm not sure why, um, Glennon, maybe, uh, if you had microphones, uh, the I do not have a headset, um, hmm. We didn't have it before, though, so it. I need to log off and log back on, maybe. Why don't you do that, and I'll turn to Roshanik, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, so Roshanik, your work is is around housing issues, and so when you talk about David talked about access broadly to education, to internet infrastructure. We talk about housing issues and disparity and and discrimination and oftentimes conversations about poverty assume that assume that a person's situation is largely tied to personal choices that they've made. Um, and your work looks a lot at systems. And you've specifically done work that looks at zip codes and uh, and how and and how how poverty becomes locked in in certain areas and and that it's definitely not personal choices but it's systemic choices um, that are driving generation to generation poverty. Can you talk about your work and how we should be thinking about? housing and public systems in this conversation? Yeah, so thank you for having me first of all. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about poverty within urban settings as you've mentioned, and in particular, uh, I'm gonna talk about inex inequities experienced across various neighborhoods through a public health lens. And to your point that you made earlier, I use the term urban and city interchangeably really using the definition of population density and the local governance attached to it. However, I am well aware of the usage of the term inner city and urban, often in media, when usually refer referencing to communities of color. So to provide a little, provide a little bit of context on how um, I came to this work in this field, I really entered it at a time where there was an influx of reports coming out 
like poverty by zip code, and others that really highlighted the differences across neighborhoods. So around this time, public health had joined this neighborhood or place-based research within urban settings um, by first looking at the disease distributions across neighborhoods and eventually then looking at the intersects with demographics and resource availability. Mapping then really took off and it became an important tool in providing um, insight on what are potential predictors for some of these more persistent uh, public health issues in our cities. However, as these maps did become more prevalent, so did uh, stigmatizing language and depiction of problem areas or high risk areas. And so some of that background to how the term inner cities and such were used. So this did contribute to the culture of having your neighborhood define who you were and people were being judged uh, by where they lived. April Lindbergh, Lind Green, sorry, at Ryerson University wrote a paper looking at news, geography, and disadvantage in Toronto neighborhoods. And she suggested that media could play a role in this negative stereotyping. And she provides this example of a young black university student who applies for a job in the provincial government and gets an email that was not intended for him by the employer to another employer stating, this is the ghetto dude I spoke to before in reference to the neighborhood where he was from. And so we've seen stories like this um, across other cities in North America and the problems associated with this stigmatization. So in an attempt to address this, some cities began improving and providing more resources and attentions uh, to these areas. But we also saw cities beginning to rebrand these neighborhoods and even renaming them, which by no coincidence, they also became fairly gentrified areas. Now I bring all of this up because while it's important to see the stark differences in life expectancy by neighborhoods, and in some cases, neighborhoods separated by a single street, the narrative of where you live matters needs to change. And what I mean by this is that in order for us to make an impact and really create change in poverty and other inequities, we need to shift the conversation to, it's not where you live, it's really why. And I'm glad you mentioned history, Luke, because to make this shift, reflecting on history plays a really large role. So in fact, I can tell you that much of today's health inequities, including those associated with COVID-19, can be traced back to a policy that was implemented almost 100 years ago. Researchers are now showing similar patterns in neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID-19 and those redlined by the homeowners loan corporation of the 1930s. For those not familiar with this, the practice of redlining consisted of banks drawing red lines on maps around neighborhoods that were predominantly black and restricting access to lending in these places. Now this practice impeded communities of color the opportunity to invest and accumulate wealth for many generations. And this is part of the context that helps us understand that why today the median white family holds about 10 times the wealth of the median black family in the US. In addition, these red lined neighborhoods uh, were also subject to decades of disinvestment, which have been linked to higher poverty rates, lower social mobility, greater exposure to air pollution and other toxins, fewer resources, including foods and transportation and general urban decline. Therefore, residents within these neighborhoods are at higher risk for COVID-19 and other negative health outcomes. Now, I wanna come back to the point that you made about home ownership and housing, as I've done some of this work uh, to really deter show that housing is a determinant of COVID-19 inequities. When the stay at home or shelter in place orders were implemented across the country to prote protect individuals from contracting the disease, for some, this was not a possibility. 
And I don't just refer to the homeless population, but also those that were and are in houses unsuitable, in unstable situations. So a lot of my work addresses poverty through housing insecurity, which is considered a material hardship, as would food insecurity, for example. Prior to the pandemic, though, lower income households were already on the verge of housing crisis, thanks to a chronic shortage of affordable housing in the US. And I'm gonna use the Department of Housing and Urban Development's definition of housing affordability that is largely measured as the ratio between housing related expenditure and household income. So households that spend more than 30% or more of their income on rent, mortgage, property taxes, utilities, and other expenses are then considered to be cost burdened. In 2018, it was estimated that 38 million or just over a quarter of US households were cost burdened. To put this into perspective, in 2019, a family living on one full-time minimum wage income was not able to afford local fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment in any U.S. city. Furthermore, from the early 2000s until prior to the pandemic, more than 2 million eviction cases were filled per year with approximately 50% of them resulting in removal of tenants. In Michigan, there was one eviction case for every six occupied rental housing units in the state, which is among the highest in the uh, rates in the country. So within urban areas in the state of Michigan, number of African Americans, children, and higher vacancy rates in a neighborhood did correlate with higher rates of eviction, eviction filings. And so this brings me back to what I've previously discussed in terms of neighborhood disinvestment. Post pandemic, the surge in unemployment rates and the impact of COVID-19 on certain communities will lead to an increase in households being at risk for losing their homes, either through eviction or foreclosures. And this is at a time that rehousing will be very challenging and there will be an increase in homeless populations, which is a population that's already deemed as high risk for contracting COVID-19. And more pressure will be placed on already overrun shelters. And, and now, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, now not everybody will be displaced, but financial stress can result in situations that will make people's homes very difficult to live in, including no electricity or water, even though it's the most effective preventive, it's known as one of the most effective preventive measures um, of hand washing, right? And so also, also, as we saw with the economic recession of the late 2000s, more households will turn to doubling up or sharing living arrangements as strategies to cope with financial stress. And we know that larger household units are more susceptible to transmission of diseases given their closer interactions and encounters within the home. Now, understanding these hardships are really critical for us in public health to really be able to address in order to keep communities healthy. And so I'll end off by saying that while COVID-19 has exposed inequities in this country, this isn't something new. And until we don't address these existing structures and systems that continue to perpetuate these inequities, we will not be able to eradicate poverty in this country. And we need to ensure that communities remain intact in order for us to not lose the diverse social fabric that is really needed for cities to succeed. And to do this, we must work in partnership with communities most affected to change the structures and systems that really do perpetuate these inequities. One of the One things of the I, I was most, most struck by listening to you, Shannon, is, is, is in the, in same, the same way that Luke started, started by pulling up those maps, now I'm hearing feedback on myself. Are you hearing that as well? Can you hear me now? That's better, yeah. I don't know what happened. I didn't touch it's, things. It's magic. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I hope we're going to be sharing the 
the maps that Luke pulled up at the beginning. And I would love to see those showing up in reporting around the country with good context around them. But Roshanik, you also talked about starting about talking about the, the public health situation where we're we currently find ourselves in and the disparities and really taking the roots of the patterns we're seeing now back decades. And as journalists, um, David or any of us can tell you that we're trained to put paragraphs in our stories, um, not graphs or, or uh, things that provide context for what we're talking about. But what I hear you both suggesting is that journalists need to be fighting a little harder to put deeper context in their stories. And, and that when you talk about neighborhoods and we hear reporting about the pandemic, there's always something that in talking about the disparity that says in these neighborhoods where people are disproportionately affected, but very little to give additional context about why people are disproportionately affected uh, and how far back that goes. And if we can add that context to our reporting when people are pushing for solutions, it forces people to bring into the conversation about solutions, very deep structural changes that are needed. Um, and so are you, are there, do you, do you have things that you, you can share Roshanik for the people on this call that maybe we can get to them afterwards that would, would provide detail on redlining and where, if there are maps that show a sort of pattern in the same way that the maps that Luke shared in the beginning? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like even in Michigan itself, we've had some great um, newspaper um, journalists, sorry, um, that have done that deep uh, dive when it comes around housing and uh, issues like Christine McDonald and Kat Stafford have done this work, like more of that investigative work. I do realize that journalists are often limited um, in space, but also in their capacity to be able to do some of this historical aspects. But even looking at the um, trajectory of the COVID uh, situation, we had COVID happen, then there was a pickup of the racial disparities associated with COVID, but in some ways without providing the historical context of why those racial disparities existed, we kind of just, let that out there without in some ways leaving individuals to come up with these uh, really incorrect and prejudgmental and uh, stigmatizing approaches to uh, make their own conclusions of why certain communities were being affected more than others. And now we're only starting to see the historical aspects of in the context of why COVID has affected certain populations more. And this is something that we really need to avoid doing in order to be able to really address and focus that system on the systemic issues that have led us to where we are today. Well, and in the most egregious cases, um, conversations that have made these disparities boiled them down to issues of personal responsibility. Oh, well, it's the people who are overweight, who eat too much fast food and do make personal choices that have made them more susceptible uh, to COVID-19, which um, is simply incorrect. Yeah, and very problematic. So I want to swing back to Glennon. Uh, we've talked about rural spaces and we've talked about urban spaces. And I want to make sure we talk about suburban poverty. Um, and I wonder if this is even, do people even consider the suburbs when we're having conversations about what disadvantage looks like in the United States? Generally not. And can you hear me? And am I echoing? Yeah. There? question. Okay. Sound great. Um, so for the purpose of this, this conversation, I'll start by just defining suburbs briefly. I'm thinking about them really as independent municipalities um, that are adjacent to or near close, you know, within the metropolitan area of a major city, but also dependent upon that city in some way. Um, and I also want to start by just acknowledging how incredibly diverse America's um, suburban spaces really are. Um, but to me, context and history really matter also. So I think it's important to think about kind of uh, 
how suburbs got to be how they are before we even think about the the condition, the current conditions in them, right? So when I say metropolitan neighborhood change, this is one of my research interested interests. What that means to me is I'm interested in the historic and contemporary structural drivers of inequality across metropolitan space. I study suburbs a lot because there's a lot happening in suburban space right now. They're changing. And so it's very interesting for me to see what that change looks like. Um, but when we think about kind of how suburbs formed, I think about really kind of two main types of suburbs, right? There are suburbs that were cities often founded before or around the same time as the central city to which they are currently considered a suburb. All right. And so these can have these suburbs can have a similar main street ap appeal that many of America, America's small towns have, but they have that added benefit of being part of a metropolitan economy. The majority of suburbs in America, however, are part of our long legacy of flight from the city, all right? Which does align with the most prevalent stereotypes of suburbs that we know, right? That these are elite spaces that afford wealth. And many of them do, but the story is really much more complex than that. And so when I think about these flight suburbs, I kind of put them in three categories. Um, first, there are what I think of as early flight suburbs. And so this is, these are suburbs formed around the late 1890s or so um, through the first half of the 20th century after a central city was founded. And they're founded as a retreat for the city's elite to escape city life, which at the time was really characterized, especially in the early part of the 20th century, is dirty and dense with poor air quality, right? And this is very much fueled by classism and racism, all right? These homes, these suburbs are characterized by um, custom homes that are of really good quality. They're generally pretty large. And a lot of them have remained elite enclaves in part because their housing utilized racial restrictions. They used racial covenants in home deeds to restrict who could own or occupy the homes in these neighborhoods. You know, so there's redlining going on on one end, which is restricting who can access loans, but wealthy neighborhoods also had other means of restricting who could live within them. And, and racial restrictions was one of those. It was, it was very prevalent up until 1948 when it was deemed unconstitutional and then other means were used. And then there's the flight that most of us think about, right? The post-World War II flight um, for many, and this is responsible for many of our suburban spaces. And these suburbs are characterized um, by smaller homes um, that were built hastily, right? Because we were trying to meet a severe housing shortage, um, particularly those built in the late 40s, 50s, and 60s. They're going to be smaller, um, and these often the ones in the you know late 40s, at least up until 48, they were platted with racial restrictions. But they usually found other ways to restrict. They were majority white. They used exclusionary tactics. The homes were mass produced, though construction techniques changed, so the quality of the housing in these places it isn't as good as the custom homes. These are the first suburbs to decline. So this is where poverty starts in a lot of suburban spaces in terms of if an entire suburb itself is declining. Um, and then there are what I classify as kind of new white flight suburbs. So these are places founded after 1980 as elite enclaves. This is flight from other suburbs generally to suburbs further out on the periphery of metropolitan space. Um, very similar to those early uh, flight from the city suburbs. And there could be overlap in these. These, these. these suburbs on the periphery that are newer sometimes have rural township poverty, poverty adjacent or, or near them. Um, a lot of the you know, early cities that were you know, built around the same time as a central city that they're now considered a suburb of, it might have a lot of post-war housing in it also. It might, you know, so there's, there's a lot of overlap between these. Um, but, but those are kind of how I think about suburbs. And so when we think about that, and we think about an entire suburban community, a municipality that might be declining, it's those post-World War II suburbs, particularly those built in, the, built in the 50s and 60s, that are the most likely to decline. Um, but there are a number of factors at play, and it's not just those. Um, but the homes themselves in these suburbs, they're old. Um, they were not custom built, mass produced. So they're just more likely to decline if they're not up cut. Uh, kept up, that is. Um, the homes are also just small and lack amenities that we value in housing today, like more than one bathroom or a first floor laundry room or just square footage. They're often just so small, right? They're often adjacent to the central city. So they're what we refer to as inner ring su suburbs. All right. And so there's this theory in housing that, that basically says that when housing ages, new housing with better amenities is built and people means will leave the old housing for the new housing, allowing the older housing to filter down to lower income buyers. And we do see that dynamic in these post-war suburbs uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, the inner rings. We also see it happening in some of these ones from the 80s or 90s, but these inner ring suburbs are 
are, are being classified or have been classified by some scholars as kind of post-suburban and that they are decline that were traditionally associated with, you know, um, central city decline, um, right? So things like increased crime rates, increasing poverty, declining schools and educational attainment, deteriorating housing stocks. Um, um, and so this, this filtering understanding is really, um, it places housing as the primary driver, but in reality, housing, class, race, economic forces all play a role. Um, and so tax base is really important when we think about inner ring suburbs, because a lot of these are what we classify as bedroom communities. These are places that are overwhelmingly single family housing and predominantly residential. Now, in the state of Ohio, that puts cities at a disadvantage in terms of how we fund city services. We do that through income taxes. But in practice, you pay income tax to where you work. Where you live only gets excess if their rate is higher. And so bedroom communities have challenges with, with revenue streams, essentially, right? Especially, you know, in Ohio, we, our local government fund was slashed. So that, that hurts um, places that are predominantly residential. And so that can put suburbs at a disadvantage as well and can lead to decline as services decline. The suburb can't afford to provide services, so people of means end up leaving places and that can, can lead to decline. Um, also, gentrification has pushed some low-income people out of central cities into suburban um, spaces, um, you know, and as people of, you know, as people of wealth suburbanized, jobs follow. So, you know, and then, so there are service jobs in suburbs. So people that had those jobs follow jobs. So that's another factor that has caused some degree of, of increase in poverty in suburbs. But suburbs are also known for their low crime rates and good schools, right? Neighborhood characteristics that are attractive to any family. So in the 1980s, around the 1980s, Immigrant populations also began bypassing central cities in favor of suburban spaces, often those inner ring suburbs that were affordable. And so poverty, and, and, and also because of fears of racial tensions in our country, white people left when immigrants moved in. And so you see neighborhood change happening. Um, and then there are other economic factors, right? Manufacturing and construction were hardest hit by the recession and uh, were two of the, the hardest hit sectors in, in the 20, 2008 recession recession, and they were also two of the most suburbanized se sectors. So just to give you a taste, um, suburbs also tended to get hit really hard with subprime loans, particularly minority suburbs. Um, and, you know, America's middle class has been shrinking for decades. So, you know, there are folks who live in suburbs, um, you know, and, and, and or the, these are folks who live in suburbs. So in some respects, when we think about economic forces, suburban populations themselves have become poorer. Um, you know, so we have declining housing stocks, new American populations, people being pushed into suburbs from gentrification. You have people living in suburbs becoming poor, um, and you have housing, you know, decline. Um, but finally, one thing that is overwhelmingly clear is that poverty, poverty in suburbs, like poverty everywhere else in America, disproportionately impacts people of color. Um, right. And so when I think about the main challenges that, that, that suburban communities face, I think really in two main ways. I think about the hidden nature of suburban poverty. So poverty can exist in wealthy suburbs. It's not just that these post-war suburbs decline. Wealthy suburbs, quote unquote wealthy suburbs with higher median incomes, right? These places can have poverty as well because of the nature of how we build suburban subdivisions, right? And how we build sub suburbs. Uh, many, many suburban subdivisions are predominantly single family housing, but they might have this, um, you know, a uh, uh, kind of segregated pocket of denser housing that might be townhomes or apartments, um, right? And they're too small to really look like an issue on census numbers, but they're located in a good school district. And so we find that a lot of low-income families with children will move into these apartments or townhomes to ask, access these good schools, right? And often these families uh, are, are housing cost burden to do so, right? Um, they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing to make this happen. So you'll have a concentration of low-income children in a small pocket in the neighborhood, attending a neighborhood school that was generally wealthy, um, which will kind of get into my next thing. But I'll finish kind of thinking about the hidden nature of poverty. So likewise, wise, you know, the cost of living is sometimes higher in suburban space, particularly when we think about housing and transportation costs. Um, so families might be living below the federal poverty line, um, might not, I'm sorry, might not be living below the federal poverty line uh, in, in suburban space, but be functionally poor because of their high housing cost burden rate, transportation, and other expenses. 
Um, often we would consider such folks struggling. Um, that is their income is below 200% of the federal poverty line, which by the way, is the eligibility threshold utilized by most hunger recognition that people who don't make 200% of the federal poverty line don't have enough money to eat food in this country. Um, but in general, it should be noted, as it's kind of been touched on by, by Luke here at the beginning, that suburban poverty isn't as deep as, as rural poverty or even some forms of, of urban poverty, right? Some people are above 100%. They might be below 135%, though, so they're eligible for uh, SNAP benefits, right? Or they might be under 185%, so they're eligible for WIC, because the federal government has acknowledged the poverty rate doesn't cut it. Um, uh, but, you know... It, it's yeah, I mean, the, the, the hidden nature of it and trying to think about this for how journalists approach their coverage. You, you mentioned, um, you mentioned denser pop pockets mm -hmm. within, within suburban communities, mm -hmm. but also we think of suburban communities for these things that you mentioned, single family homes, mm -hmm. better schools, low rates of crime. and the and you see a single family home but you don't know the situation in that home mm -hmm. you don't know how many families are in that home mm -hmm. how many of them are working how many people have to share what mode of transportation um and because of some of the other trappings of suburban life mm -hmm. is is even reaching out for services or or, or trying to be seen difficult because of the structure of, of suburban life. Yeah, so that's actually my other point I was going to make is that like rural spaces, um, that like David was kind of getting at, suburban spaces often lack the social service infrastructure needed to support low-income residents. All right, and part of this has to do with, like su suburban poverty is very stigmatized because there is this notion that suburbs are elite and wealthier spaces. Right. And so people don't it's not talked about. The poverty isn't talked about. That makes it less visible. Right. And because it's not talked about and it's, you know, and it's hidden um, and stigmatized, people are less likely to ask for help. But they're also less likely to find it if they do. Um, and it's a relatively new phenomenon, um, you know, and there are there aren't a density of hunger relief services or other social services. And in terms of hunger relief, what we're really missing out on in sub suburbs is, is, is free meal sites and things like that, you know, and in urban, I, I do a lot of work in partnership with urban communities as well. And, you know, I've had people tell me, oh, I can get free food any day of the week on the south side of Columbus or in the hilltop on Columbus, right? But, you know, it's these other things that I need. I, I, I don't need free food. I don't hear that when I'm working in suburban spaces because that social service infrastructure does not exist in the same way. Um, so I, I think that's, that's, that's a huge challenge. And that also exists in schools, right? Suburban schools um, aren't, aren't, don't, don't have the programs in place often uh, and, and funded to support low income student populations. Um, and state funding models really aren't designed, at least in Ohio, to identify where areas of growing poverty are, are happening um, so that they can help fund those things. So, you know, and schools matter. If a school start, if school's quality starts to slip in a suburb, people leave, all right? And the suburb starts to decline. And so, you know, as poverty does rise a little bit in the suburb, you know, maintaining high quality schools matters. And if, you know, districts have to cut some services to bring in others, it can lead to further decline. Now, I'm not saying anything about the fairness of that. That is a factor that exists in suburban space. We're, we're going to start to transition to questions. Um, Glennon, I just saw a question that related to something I was about to ask you because you, you did talk, you talked about gentrification. Uh, mm -hmm. Roshanet mentioned this too, but I'm wondering about sort of a leapfrogging effect that might be affecting suburban poverty. As, as gentrification speeds up, people who had fled to the suburbs mm -hmm. to escape the creation of whatever they thought was happening in cities mm -hmm. are now choosing to move back into the cities mm -hmm. and people with means are moving to further out suburbs with more amenities and more separation. And so you have elite portions of cities and outer mm -hmm. ring suburbs and and 
people who thought they were doing the they were doing what other people were doing for mobility are stuck in this in-between space. And so can you talk just a little bit more about gentrification and and how it has played into these these suburban communities that are often invisible? Is that about location? Is that what you said you broke up for a second? It, it's a it's about the how gentrification contributes to this. So how okay. movement back okay. into the cities might be uh, might be contributing to this and displacement. I mean, yeah, I mean it. It absolutely is. There's no doubt that when you know, so you know these quote unquote urban you know neighborhoods that are gentrifying are neighborhoods that have really high quality housing stocks. These housing stocks are built before World War II. They're custom. A lot of them are Victorians. They're large. Um, they have a good. They have good bones. All right. These Levitt towns, post World War II housing, the bones of those buildings are not the same quality. So it's very attractive for people to go back to the city and and, and rehab these these older homes. Right. You can do that in some suburbs as well. There are suburbs that are old enough that they have some of this attractive housing stock. Some of these suburbs have declined because they also have a lot of post-war housing where you can see some of this, this rehab happening in some suburban spaces that are older as well. Um, but for the most part, what you do see happening is people, people are moving in for walkability. You're also seeing, though, density and or post-suburban density in the sense of post-suburban being in terms of built environment happening on the periphery of cities as well. Because one thing about metropolitan space that we should keep in mind is that municipalities within metropolitan space are constantly competing for tax base and residents. All right. Until recently, the desires of residents were in conflict with tax base. That has changed. Most people, trends are moving towards people wanting to live in denser environments that are more walkable with a mix of uses. Mix of use increases your tax base. So, you know, there's this this competition places that are predominantly bedroom communities particularly that first ring of suburbs of that that you know the um post world war ii the early version the 50s and 60s flight white flight they're predominantly bedroom communities so they don't have the like tax i just can't emphasize how much taxes matter and a city's fiscal health matters in terms of of how much poverty can, will grow in that community. And what suburbs need to be thinking about is cooperating in metropolitan space um, so that, you know, maybe fair share housing policies and things like that so that, you know, wealthier suburbs are taking their fair share of affordable housing so we don't see concentrations in communities like these, these inner ring suburbs. Um, did that answer your question? Was it, that answer? And I wanted to. I wanted to point out so that question came from Sandia Dirks, uh, and your answer to it leads to, I think, you know, one of the public health issues that Roshanik was talking about. Um, I, I wonder about the trends in a desire for density post COVID, right? So people with means decided they wanted to move to cities. And so they moved to cities and organic groceries went to those places. And people who thought they were going to good schools moved to suburbs, just as people who were supporting those suburbs decided to move back into the city. Um, and when, when the pandemic hit in places, in cities with a lot of density, what we saw is people with means actually left the city. And, and went to second houses or rented houses or, you know, went to the country for people who could do that. And so what you see is, is who gets left behind in all of these, mm -hmm. in all of these issues around mobility. Um, and, and so I wonder as, as trends have moved toward creating urban, urban spaces, mixed use, walkable neighborhoods, whether what we're going through now might might interrupt some of those trends. I don't know if you have thoughts on on that as it relates to poverty. Any of you? Um, 
So I can talk a little bit about that because okay. I know, I think it was Emily Badger from New York Times did a piece on density on um, post COVID mm -hmm. or during COVID and such. And I do argue both sides. Um, mm -hmm. Density does mean easier transmission of the disease through populations. However, on the other side, density also mm -hmm. allows for other resources and social services and um, even kind of the opposite of social isolation, which has its own benefits that do, like that's something in public health that we're constantly talking about is like which one outweighs the other in terms of that. Now I will say within the cities, um, all eyes are on European cities right now, which are highly dense um, to see what has happened. So my colleagues in Barcelona were forced to stay in their homes for three or four months without even being allowed uh, to step out other than shopping for groceries or going to the doctors. Um, and so it'll be interesting to study the mental health implications of these high density, regardless of um, social class, but of course, social class potentially having um, an impact on it. But I mean, it was a situation where everybody was impacted in these high dense areas. But I think one thing that was really problematic, and I think again, um, the New York Times reported a map of in New York City, as soon as the outbreak happened, this large displacement to the Hamptons and to these other places. And similarly in Michigan, I think one of the things that the governor really stressed is do not leave your homes. And I think people forget that. And here's the intersection of urban and rural. A lot of people were leaving for the UP. A lot of people were leaving to these um, to these counties where, uh, cottage counties, sorry, and they were putting people there at risk. At one point, some of the hospitals in the Upper Peninsula were on the verge of bankruptcy. And so we have to understand the, the core or the intersect between these two areas um, and really not study them so far apart, but also here is COVID-19 that has shown kind of how the two do interact and what that means in terms of disease uh, spread and other factors to consider. We, we have a question from, from Raj, and I think this is for David, um, related to, to rural areas. But Luke, I would love for you to jump in too. The question is, what's the main reason for poverty in rural areas? That's obviously a complex answer, but uh, and Luke's probably better at addressing some of that down the road. But I think a lot of it is this uh, this cycle we've been talking about, um, you know, of of jobs, of having an ability to 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 make money, and then having the training to um, to get those jobs, to attract those jobs. To have some sort of of way to 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 make the money that's needed for you know for living. It's interesting, you know, talking about jobs, right? So we talked earlier about Baldwin, this this small city. When I was there, they were very excited because um, a private prison was coming in, and they were going to be running um, for uh, folks picked up um, undocumented immigrants who had been arrested. They're very excited about that. Well, why were they excited? Well, because their jobs there were going to be $16, $17 an hour, an hour, an hour jobs that didn't need any training. And so when you start talking about, about reasons for rural poverty, it's so much of this vicious cycle of not having jobs, of not having training, of not having any systematic um, support system uh, to get that all together, just sort of letting people, we're going to let people live and try to figure it out, try to scrape out uh, out, out what they can. Um, and that has ripple effects down the road. So you have, you have 36 counties in Michigan. There's 82 counties in Michigan. There's 36 counties in Michigan where there are no hospitals that deliver babies. So skip living, you know, 15, 20 minutes out of town you know, the nearest town to go into the hospital to have your have your baby. Now you're driving, you know, a half an hour more. You're gonna drive to the next county or two counties over, um, just to just to have a baby. So that's 
that's all that issue, kind of that cycle that's wrapped up. And until we break that cycle, um, you're going to have a you're going to have a have problems. Luke, do you want to to jump in here and talk about rural poverty a bit more? Yeah, I just wanted to point out. I think um, in listening, Lynette, to your introduction to David's work and to the language David was just using, I think this is a great example of reframing poverty narratives. So we often hear about a cycle of poverty or an intergenerational transmission of poverty. And usually what people are referring to is, you know, a family that doesn't have the skills to succeed um, or has challenges. And then the parents sort of pass that on to the kids. And the what what David describes and what you described, Lynette, is maybe sort of a more empirically validated cycle of poverty, which is like a community level cycle of poverty uh, with jobs. You know, there aren't enough jobs in a rural community. Uh, there are not enough people to fill them. So the um, manufacturing plant closes down uh, and then we can't attract it uh, because there aren't enough people. And then the training opportunities go away. And, and even if we do have enough people, now we don't have the skills that they need. That's a cycle of poverty. So I think it's a great example of reframing how people think about things just to broaden their view. And, you know, what's, you know, more important about journalism, I think, than trying to get people to think about things in a different way um, than they did before and revealing parts of the world. So I'll just mention affordable transportation is another, I'm sorry, uh, transportation is an issue, but I wanted to talk about housing. So we just heard about gentrification and Rashanik mentioned sort of this phenomenon of folks with means in Michigan sort of going up to their cabins to wait out the shelter in place order. Well, we have been interested in our work at Poverty Solutions as we went all across the state hearing about people's issues. Uh, again, we were pretty familiar with the idea of affordable housing as an issue in cities. And, you know, especially in like a city like New York, um, as housing prices drive up as people move in. It's a huge issue in rural parts, especially on the western coast of Michigan. And we heard as a, like a predominant thing as people with means buy vacation homes or retirement homes, driving up the price of all of the housing stock up there and really leaving people um, without a lot of options. So the three things, I won't say I know exactly what the root causes are, but clearly jobs is a piece of it in the sort of cycle it creates with jobs and education. Uh, clearly housing is a really big issue and transportation, obviously. Um, and, and then the density issue with the services. So that's across the board. Uh, I know in social services, when you think about food pantries, as Glennon was mentioning, in, in cities, we spend something like $500, $600 per low-income person, according to estimates. I've, I've seen charts that suggest uh, in rural areas, it's like $40 per person because there isn't the scale and, and there isn't the capacity to get the grants that then brings that type of resource on. Hmm. There, there was a question um, at the beginning I, I, as the scroll moved down, I missed this question, so I wanna go back to it. And I wanna remind people to use the chat box on the right side of your screen to submit your questions. We'll try to get to them. And also we have someone monitoring YouTube and Twitter. Um, you can use the hashtag hashtag poverty narrative to make sure your questions get to us. There was an early question from Dr. Bianca DM Wilson. We've been talking primarily about uh, neighborhoods and types of communities, but how do we connect neighborhoods as a predictor of poverty to what we know about LGBTQ people experiencing higher rates of poverty when most don't live in neighborhoods that are explicitly LGBT neighborhoods. Glenn, I, would, I would say that both neighborhoods and identity are actually predictors of poverty in the United States and that discrimination has been codified into law in the United States through policies like redlining, uh, the prolific use of racially restrictive covenants, the way we fund schools, all kinds of things. Um, I think there, you know, there are similar until this week, you know, we didn't have protections for LGBTQ individuals in the workplace at, at the federal level. This was being done at local levels throughout the country. And so I think that 
that those protections and laws matter. So I would say that law um, and, and identity can be a predictor because we have discriminatory laws in our country. Again, about systems. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from Harshita Pia. What role do increased or varied physical transportation systems play in facilitating social mobility? I think transportation, we can answer this both in rural, for rural areas and also for suburban areas. Well, I go first, David. Yeah, I'm Before, happy to. Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah, I'll just mention that um, I think transportation is one of these issues that is really felt across place. And just to track back to the last question, you know, place can, it's a piece of this puzzle, but uh, sometimes, as I think Roshanika Stuley points out, it can sort of reify things. And that's why we need important articles like David's article um, some years ago about poverty in Ann Arbor, right? So if we think of a place as an affluent place, we often miss a lot of the, um, the importance that there are still people who are struggling in that place. Uh, with transportation, uh, that is just an issue that affects um, folks in cities and suburbs and rural areas, uh, the distances that people need to go. It'll be interesting to watch in the post-COVID era as we uh, see how does, if, if we do, where I think we're at a turning point, we can decide like through expanding access to broadband, can we actually cut into some of those distances, whether it be for doctor's appointments or jobs, but I think we still need to be able to tell um, sometimes with transportation, I, I personally think, again, there's opportunities to look at pieces of the puzzles that are often forgotten. So our own work uh, is we, in a survey that we do uh, in the city of Detroit, a representative survey, we ask folks, what's their top priority for um, improving transportation in the city? Um, and by far the top um, priority a year ago was reducing the cost of auto insurance. And that led to look at an entire system of auto insurance that was extremely expensive, still is, and we have a reform and we're going to see if it works, but tended to impact low income families the most. So that's sort of like a frame that uh, was different where if I want to address transportation, maybe that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, and then, of course, there's a big piece of history, right? So regional transit in Metro Detroit is a huge issue to the growth of the region. And you know we had a we had it on the ballot in 2016, and it came close but didn't pass. Uh, and so we're sort of stuck, and that's especially problematic when a lot of the jobs that are available to people who don't have a lot of means are in the suburbs. So how do we um, get across that? And once again, history plays a role, right? So just to say, oh, it didn't pass, you know, it didn't have the what we needed, but understanding the dynamics between the city of Detroit in the suburbs, right? And that history of, of trying to um, sort of divide, right? And segregate. And, you know, some of that is wrapped up in exactly the, the redlining um, history that Rashanik pointed out to. Like that's, that's an important frame that we have to understand to sort of really figure out if we're gonna have any chance of sort of solving that, that problem going forward. There, there's a question here um, for, uh, that I think We'll start with David. And we have, this is about coverage. And Christine Modi asks, how do you see journalists and scholars and maybe others working together to shift the narrative about poverty and also making a material difference in, in how we address poverty in states and in the country? Um, what, can we be, what can we be doing differently? Well, I think we have talked a lot about uh, that the history and the context and how you how you bring those items into your into your story. So, as a journalist, what can I do? And I think things like this, the people who are on this call, the experts that are uh, showing up on these panels across the the series here of in the in this month, you know, are a great starting point to kind of reach out to and to have those discussions. So 
not only are you writing a story, okay, so the editor comes to you and says, you know, do a story on COVID and how come we're seeing all these cases in, in Detroit, and right? And so you're going to have to call and talk to somebody about it. It's taking the time to ask that extra question to say, you know, what more can you tell me? How does this compare to what's gone on before? What isn't being, one of my favorite questions to ask is what isn't being covered? Um, and then it's approaching that um, assignment with a with an open mind, right? And so you're talking about rural poverty. Let's go up and see what's actually going there in an open mind of having those discussions um, with 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 folks. And then it's the interaction back and forth. It's also having conversations, you know, with uh, with with the people who are doing these studies and who are doing this stuff. Um, not necessarily even for a story, but just to kind of work together to, to create that framework so I can see, you know, what Luke is doing on his stuff working in rural. And now I can bring that with my journalistic approach and we can meld those together and come up with this series of stories that really kind of, as Luke said, work to reshape some of the narrative around rural poverty. And, and I want to ask a question to the audience and ask you to type some things in. As for the journalists who are listening in, what kinds of resources would help you to do your work better? I saw before this panel started, somebody said, you know, how can we avoid parachute journalism? Well, the, the, the realistic answer is that we can't, that, that sometimes stories break and you have to move into an area quickly and you have no time to get sourced up and you have to turn around a story quickly. And so what resources can we provide journalists that can help them update their understanding of these different spaces? And so I'd love for people to just type in if you have things that might be useful um, for you. And Luke, while, while people are doing that, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think about this question about how can journalists and scholars be working together? One of the things I, I really like about this series you've pulled together it is, is it's blended. Oftentimes, especially in the summer, which is typically conference season, journalists all go to their journalism conferences and researchers come and uh, professors go to the conferences and, and we don't often or not enough talk to one another. Uh, and so what could we be doing together to make this work more accessible uh, and to help journalists factor these levels of nuance into their work? Well, I hope this is a start, as you said, Lynette, that we can um, be doing, we should be doing more and not just interacting sort of a, uh, 24 hours before the end of a deadline or four hours before the end of a deadline and and, and getting to know each other. Um, so we'll look for as, as many of those types of opportunities, uh, I think, as we go. I guess the one challenge I would have for academics, so speaking to you all, my colleagues, uh, is I think we need to learn how to talk about our work in ways that are accessible to people. So I think uh, a lot in academia, we're sort of trained to write about things, um, to really sort of revel in the complexity, and that's good. Like, spent the whole you know hour here talking about complexity, but we can do better, right? Of trying to to break things down and use um, fewer acronyms and few use like fewer explain things in terms that um, are familiar to people outside of our disciplines. Um, and I think, honestly, we need to do a lot better at just connecting all of the work that we do uh, to the world around us uh, and, and really thinking that the whole purpose of the academy, I think, is the, for the benefit of humanity. And uh, if we can't sort of speak to the things that we've done uh, in the last few months or the last year that have had an, some sort of actionable impact on the, our community, then I'm not sure we're living into our mission. I, I think those are great words to wrap up on. And, and Luke, I think people in the audience are eager for more sharing. One of the things that uh, someone typed 
in response to what people need is is an easily accessible list of sources that can speak to these differences in poverty. And so not just a bucket of poverty experts, but something with some description that would break down um, people's areas of expertise and distinctions in, in the topic that would help people even think about how they generate their stories in the first place. The, just the general term poverty um, leads to a lot of minefields, I think, mm -hmm. traps that people can fall into. So um, thank you all for bringing your expertise and your thoughtfulness to this conversation. I know I learned a lot. I hope everybody listening learned a lot. And we want to thank everybody who participated today. Uh, when I checked before we started, there were hundreds of us participating in this conversation. And so I trust that it will result in um, more stories being produced, more nuanced stories being produced, and more talk about this subject across disciplines. Um, thank you for all those who joined us and participated on YouTube Live. And I want to remind everyone that this series continues throughout June, and we invite you to tune in for the next session, which is where public policy meets real life. That's next Tuesday, June 23rd at noon. And in this panel, veteran journalists will share their experiences cutting through the wonky world of public policy to uncover real world issues and the impact of policymakers' decisions. So that'll be another great conversation. I hope you all will join. Thank you to our panelists today uh, and Luke and everyone at Poverty Solutions. Thank you. Um, for pulling this all together. It's a tremendous resource. And I wanna say again, I'm sure everybody wants those maps that you showed at the beginning. So let's make that and other resources available. For more information on anything we've talked about today and on any work related to the poverty narrative in the United States, uh, you can visit poverty.umich.edu to take a look at the great work that's being done by Poverty Solutions here at the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye guys.